The Bible tells us about Enoch, who was Adam's great-grandson and Noah's great-grandfather. He lived a good life following God's ways. Enoch was Methuselah's father, and Methuselah was the oldest person in the Bible. Enoch lived for more than 300 years and had many kids. He was special because, unlike almost everyone else, he didn't die but was taken straight to heaven. In today's video, we'll discuss the story of Enoch, including insights from the pseudonymous Book of Enoch. Welcome to Witnessing Jesus Christ. Before we dive in, I kindly ask for your support by subscribing to the channel and turning on notifications. If you enjoy the content, please leave a like, as it greatly encourages me to create more videos. Without delay, let's get started with the discussion. In the Bible, names often have deep meanings, reflecting God's plan. For example, Enoch means teaching or instruction. This connection is a part of God's larger story, even pointing towards the birth of Jesus Christ. The significance of names from Adam to Noah, including Enoch's, is highlighted in the Bible. Specifically, Genesis 5.29 discusses another name, Lamech's hope for Noah, not Enoch, as misstated, with Enoch being a different figure, illustrating how names convey hope and prophecy about relief from hardship. The importance of the meanings behind the names of Enoch's descendants ties back to how these names tell a story of redemption and God's interaction with humanity. Each name is a piece of a larger narrative, with Enoch's own life and name being a direct instruction or connection to God's teachings. Let's dive deeper into this connection and explore how the meanings behind these names, including Enoch's, contribute to the biblical story. The meanings of the names from Adam to Noah in the Bible form a fascinating sentence that tells a story of hope and redemption. Here's a breakdown of each name and its meaning, which, when linked together, convey a powerful message. Adam means man. Seth means appointed. Enosh, often transliterated as such but can vary in spelling, means mortal or weak. Kenan or Kainan means sorrow, dirge or elegy. Mahalalel means blessed God or praise of God. Jared means shall come down or descent. Enoch means teaching or instruction. Methuselah means his death shall bring or is often interpreted as when he dies, judgment shall come. Lamech can be interpreted as despairing. Though this is less direct than other names, Noah means rest or comfort. When these meanings are combined, they form a prophetic statement. Man is appointed mortal sorrow but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death shall bring the despairing rest and comfort. This interpretation sees the list of names from Adam to Noah as a summary of the gospel message, illustrating the fall of man and God's plan for redemption through suffering and sacrifice, ultimately offering hope and comfort to humanity. The person I'm describing who was taken directly to heaven without experiencing death is indeed Enoch. He is a figure from the Bible, mentioned in the book of Genesis. Enoch's story is a bit less well known compared to Elijah, but it's still significant. Enoch was a righteous man who walked closely with God, and the Bible says that God took him because of his righteousness, sparing him from experiencing death. This event is described in Genesis 5:24, and Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Enoch's translation to heaven without dying is seen as a testament to his exceptional faith and closeness to God. While his story is brief in the Bible, it carries a profound message about the rewards of living a faithful life and having a close relationship with God. Enoch's story, as presented in the Bible, is indeed quite mysterious and unique. He appears in Genesis, and shortly after his introduction, it's mentioned that he walked with God, 
and then was taken directly to heaven without experiencing death. Unlike other prominent figures in Hebrews chapter 11, such as Abraham, Moses and David, who all faced physical death, Enoch seems to have bypassed this process entirely. The Bible doesn't provide explicit details about how Enoch was taken up to heaven, leaving much to speculation and interpretation. However, what is clear is that Enoch's exceptional faith and close relationship with God set him apart. His translation to heaven without experiencing death underscores the extraordinary nature of his life and faith. Extra-biblical sources such as the Book of Enoch provide additional details and legends surrounding Enoch's life and teachings. While these sources are not considered canonical scripture, they offer insights into how ancient communities understood and interpreted Enoch's significance. The question of why Enoch was spared from death while others faced it is a matter of interpretation and theological reflection. Some view Enoch's translation as a special reward for his exceptional faithfulness, while others see it as a foreshadowing of the resurrection and eternal life promised to believers in Christ. Our discussion brings up two fascinating points related to biblical narratives and interpretations concerning Enoch and Noah, their significance, and the lessons drawn from their stories for contemporary faith. 1. Enoch as a prefigurement of the rapture. The idea that Enoch's being caught up to heaven prefigures the rapture is a common interpretation in some Christian traditions. This perspective sees Enoch's translation as a type or foreshadowing of the event described in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, where believers are said to be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The timing of the rapture in relation to the end times, notably the seven-year tribulation, remains a topic of diverse opinions among Christians. These interpretations include pre-tribulation, before the tribulation starts, mid-tribulation at the halfway point, and post-tribulation, after the tribulation ends, viewpoints. Enoch's story is seen as an example of God's ability to deliver his faithful from judgment, paralleling the hope of the rapture. 2. Noah and the Antediluvian World Your mention of Noah introduces another significant biblical narrative that touches on themes of judgment, salvation, and divine intervention. The period before the flood, Antediluvian, is noted for its moral decline, with Noah being a righteous figure amidst widespread depravity. The speculation about a vapor canopy is based on interpretations seeking to explain the longevity of early Genesis figures and the global climate before the flood. This canopy, purportedly collapsing at the time of the flood, is theorized to have contributed to the long lifespans by blocking harmful radiation and creating a stable, temperate climate globally. The skepticism Noah faced when warning of the impending flood underscores themes of faithfulness against disbelief and divine warning going unheeded, which are recurrent in biblical narratives. The flood itself, marking the first recorded rain according to this interpretation, signifies a pivotal moment in divine judgment and the re-establishment of the covenant between God and humanity. These stories from the early chapters of Genesis serve multiple purposes in biblical theology. They offer moral and spiritual lessons, illustrate God's interactions with humanity, and provide types or foreshadows of future redemptive acts in Christian eschatology. Whether viewed through the lens of literal historical account, allegorical meaning, or theological typology, the narratives of Enoch and Noah continue to fascinate and inspire believers with their depth and complexity. It's true that the biblical narrative of Enoch is relatively brief, leaving much to speculation and interpretation. However, outside of the canonical Bible, there are additional sources that provide insights into Enoch's story, notably the Book of Enoch. Before delving into the Book of Enoch, it's important to clarify that opinions on its canonical status vary among Christian traditions. 
While some consider it to be part of their canon, others regard it as pseudonymous, meaning it's attributed to someone other than its actual author. The Book of Enoch is an ancient Jewish text, composed before the time of Christ, and is not included in the canonical Bible. It's considered apocalyptic literature, focusing on visions and prophecies concerning the end times. In the Book of Enoch, Enoch's story is elaborated upon, describing his encounters with angels, his journeys through heavenly realms, and his role as a prophet warning humanity of impending judgment. The book provides additional context and depth to Enoch's character and his relationship with God. Some scholars suggest that passages in Jude 1, 14, 15 and 2 Peter 2, 4, 6 may draw from or allude to traditions found in the Book of Enoch. However, this does not necessarily imply that the Book of Enoch should be considered canonical or authoritative in the same way as the biblical texts. Regardless of its canonical status, the Book of Enoch remains a significant historical and theological text, offering valuable insights into ancient Jewish thought and beliefs about the figure of Enoch and the end times. However, its interpretation and acceptance vary among different Christian communities. Indeed, parallels can be drawn between the story of Enoch and the themes found in the Book of Revelation, often referred to as the Apocalypse. Both narratives touch on concepts of angels, divine judgment, prophecy, and the fate of the wicked. In the Book of Enoch, there is a significant focus on angels and their interactions with humanity, particularly the fallen angels known as the Nephilim. These fallen angels are said to have corrupted humanity, leading to widespread wickedness and ultimately resulting in divine judgment. This narrative mirrors elements found in the Book of Revelation, where angels play a crucial role in executing God's judgments upon the earth. Additionally, both Enoch and Revelation contain prophecies about the end times, including visions of future events and the punishment of the wicked. They both depict a world increasingly engulfed in moral depravity, culminating in divine intervention and the establishment of God's kingdom. As Christians living in a morally depraved world, we are called to be righteous and faithful, following the example of figures like Enoch who walked closely with God. While we may face trials and tribulations, including the pains of death, we hold on to the hope of Christ's return and the promise of eternal life. The concept of the rapture, as described in various interpretations of biblical prophecy, serves as a reminder of the ultimate redemption and deliverance awaiting believers in the end times. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, 18 Indeed discusses the belief among many Christians that both those who have died in Christ and those who are still alive at the time of the rapture will be caught up together to meet Jesus in the air. This passage emphasizes the unity of believers, whether alive or deceased, in their eventual reunion with Christ. Regarding the mention of Enochian, it's important to note that this term refers to a language associated with 16th century occultists John Dee and Edward Kelly, not to be confused with the biblical patriarch Enoch. John Dee and Edward Kelly claim to have received this language through angelic revelation and used it in their occult practices. However, the connection between this language and the biblical Enoch is purely speculative and not supported by historical or biblical evidence. The concept of Enochian has primarily been associated with occultism and esoteric practices rather than with biblical or theological study. It's important for Christians to discern and be cautious about teachings and practices that deviate from biblical truth and may lead to confusion or spiritual harm. Ultimately, our focus should be on understanding and following the teachings of the Bible and growing in our relationship with Jesus Christ. John Dee and Edward Kelly's practices, as you've described, 
delve deeply into the realms of occultism and esotericism. Their use of objects such as a black obsidian mirror and a crystal ball is typical of scrying, a means of divination or revelation through reflective surfaces or other mediums believed to reveal visions. Scrying and other such practices have been part of various mystical and occult traditions throughout history. Dee and Kelly's sessions involved complex rituals that they claimed allowed them to communicate with angels. The guidance they received during these sessions purportedly included revelations about the nature of the universe, the structure of the spiritual realm, and even promises of superhuman powers and transformative societal changes leading up to the apocalypse. Such claims reflect the esoteric belief in the power of hidden knowledge and magic to influence the material world and human destiny. Despite the grandiose nature of their claims, it's crucial to approach these historical accounts with a critical perspective. The practices of Dee and Kelly, including their alleged angelic communications and the Enochian or angelical language, stand outside the boundaries of orthodox Christian belief and practice. The Church has traditionally regarded such occult practices with caution, warning against seeking spiritual knowledge or power outside of God's revelation in Scripture. John Dee's belief in the potential benefits of his work for posterity and his extensive documentation of their experiences contributed significantly to the Western esoteric tradition. However, his preference for referring to the communicated language as angelical or celestial speech rather than Enochian suggests an attempt to frame their practices within a context of divine or heavenly authority. Yet, for Christians, the source of truth and divine revelation is found in the Bible, and practices seeking to bypass scripture or Christian doctrine by invoking hidden powers or secret knowledge are viewed with skepticism and caution. The Christian faith emphasizes a direct relationship with God through Jesus Christ, grounded in the teachings of Scripture rather than through esoteric or occult practices. Enoch is indeed a fascinating biblical figure, and understanding his story can shed light on important aspects of biblical history and theology. In the Bible, there are two individuals named Enoch, and it's crucial to differentiate between them. The first Enoch mentioned in the Bible was the eldest son of Cain, who built a city and named it after his son, Enoch. This lineage is associated with Cain's descendants, known for their wickedness. The second Enoch, from the lineage of Seth, is the more well-known Enoch. He was the son of Jared and is famous for his close relationship with God and his extraordinary translation to heaven without experiencing death. Enoch from Seth's lineage is the one often referred to in discussions about his remarkable faith and his role as the father of Methuselah, who lived the longest recorded lifespan in human history, 969 years. While the Bibli Provid is limited information about Enoch's life and family, his story remains significant for its portrayal of faithfulness and closeness to God. Enoch serves as an example of righteous living amidst a sinful world and the rewards of walking closely with God. Although Enoch's other children are not named in the biblical text, his legacy as a righteous figure and his unique destiny of being taken to heaven without death continue to captivate readers and inspire discussions about faith and divine intervention. Enoch's relationship with God is indeed highlighted in the Bible, particularly through the statement that he walked with God. This expression is unique, as it's only applied to Enoch and Noah in the entire biblical narrative. Noah, interestingly, was Enoch's great-grandson, further emphasizing the continuity of faith within their lineage. The biblical text describes Enoch as living for 365 years, during which he had a close communion with God. Then, without experiencing death, God took him to himself. Some scholars suggest that the number 365 may symbolize a complete and privileged life, 
akin to the days in a solar year. However, interpreting Enoch's age symbolically raises challenges as the genealogical record in Genesis 5 generally doesn't employ symbolic language. Therefore, it's commonly understood that Enoch's age was likely meant to be taken literally. Enoch's relatively short life on Earth contrasts with the longevity of his son Methuselah, who lived the longest recorded lifespan in the Bible. However, the significance lies not in the length of Enoch's life, but in his close relationship with God. The text emphasizes Enoch's unique privilege of walking in the immediate presence of God, which is considered a greater blessing than a long life on earth. Enoch's story serves as a reminder of the importance of intimate communion with God and the transformative power of faithfulness. His example encourages believers to cultivate a deep relationship with God, walking closely with Him in faith and obedience, regardless of the length of our earthly lives. The biblical narrative of Enoch being taken by God has indeed sparked diverse interpretations among scholars and theologians. Jewish traditions vary in their understanding, with some interpreting the phrase God took him as a metaphorical expression indicating Enoch's untimely but peaceful death. However, within Christianity the predominant view is that Genesis literally means that Enoch did not experience death and was taken bodily into the presence of God. This interpretation is reinforced by the letter to the Hebrews, which explicitly states that by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. Enoch's translation into the presence of God without experiencing death is significant for several reasons within Christian theologue. 1. Foreshadowing of the rapture. Enoch's translation is seen as a precursor to the future rapture of the church, where believers are expected to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, as described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17. 2. Teaching on Immortality. Enoch's being taken by God illustrates the concept of immortality and life beyond death from the early Old Testament period. 3. Testimony of Faith. Enoch is celebrated in the New Testament, especially in Hebrews 11, as a hero of faith whose life pleased God. His translation is attributed to his faith and his walk with God. 4. Prophecy and Judgment. Jude's epistle mentions Enoch as a prophet who warned about divine judgment against wickedness. This reference has led to discussions about Jude's source, whether it was the apocryphal book of Enoch or an oral tradition that included similar prophecies. Regarding the book of Enoch, there are indeed multiple texts attributed to Enoch. The first book of Enoch, One Enoch. This is the most well-known and widely studied of the Enoch texts, containing a range of materials including visions of heaven, angelology, and prophecies. It is from this book that Jude is thought to have quoted. The second book of Enoch, to Enoch, or the Slavonic book of Enoch. This text, preserved in Old Church Slavonic, deals with Enoch's ascension to heaven and his revelations about the cosmos and the divine order. The third book of Enoch, three Enoch, or the Hebrew book of Enoch. Written in Hebrew, this text focuses on the metamorphosis of Enoch into the angel Metatron. Scholars debate the extent to which these texts reflect genuine traditions about Enoch and whether Jude's reference to Enoch's prophecy gives some level of credence to the book of Enoch. While not considered canonical scripture in most Jewish and Christian traditions, the book of Enoch holds significant historical and theological interest, providing insight into Second Temple Judaism and early Christian thought. The Book of Enoch, along with the Second Book of Enoch and the Book of Enoch, are ancient texts that contain various accounts, visions, and prophecies attributed to the biblical figure Enoch. Among these, the first Book of Enoch is the most well-known and extensively studied, particularly in its Ethiopian version. While these books claim authorship by Enoch, 
Scholars generally agree that they were not written by the biblical Enoch himself. Instead, they likely originated during the intertestamental period, between the 3rd century BCE and the 1st century CE. The earliest fragments of these texts date back to around 200 BCE, with later manuscripts appearing up to the end of the 1st century CE. Despite their attribution to Enoch, the content of these books reflects a variety of influences and traditions from the time periods in which they were written. Some scholars suggest that certain portions of the Book of Enoch may contain oral traditions or sayings attributed to Enoch that were preserved and transmitted over time. Opinions vary among Christians regarding the importance and validity of these extra-biblical texts. While some may find value in studying them for historical and theological insights, others, like yourself, may feel that the 66 books of the Bible are sufficient for their knowledge and faith. Ultimately, the decision to engage with texts like the Book of Enoch is a personal one, and it's important to approach them with discernment and a critical eye. They can provide additional context and perspectives on ancient Jewish and Christian beliefs, but they are not considered canonical scripture in most Christian traditions. Asking for opinions and engaging in respectful discussion about these texts can be beneficial for deepening one's understanding of biblical history and theology, However, it's essential to prioritize the authoritative teachings of the Bible while exploring extra-biblical sources. Enoch's story was short but interesting. Have you ever read the Book of Enoch? Share your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel.